All right, it looks like we are all good to go. Um, hello, you are in cybersecurity framework for K-12, how we get the attention at all levels. Um, I'm gonna introduce it in just a second, but as we let everyone trickle in, uh, Don and Dr. Travis, I'm gonna ask if y'all have any ACPE memories you wish to share. This is being recorded, right? <laughs> and, and it will be broadcast, it's broadcast live too, to, to all your colleagues, so. So probably can't, I mean, one of my fondest one, memories from up on the mountain was, and I won't name any names, but there used to be a thing where Cisco would host a, a margarita room. And th there, there was one year that um, one person at one organization that may have been tied to somebody on the ACPE board probably couldn't have found their way home. And so myself and somebody else had to, help this person make it back to to the end and um, kind of slide them into their door into the room I'll let you all fill in the blank <laughs> I have heard there have been more than one golf cart rescue over <laughs> the years <laughs> and Dr. Travis what about you anything memorable you know I, I think what really stands out for me is a chance to to get you know it, it, the mountain isn't too far from us, so we, we managed to get a fairly good representation out there. And it's it's really nice to be able to sit down with your teams and, and work with the teams from other districts as well and just kind of share some war stories. It, it's great to be able to talk with people um, and not be on that rush to the next meeting or you know trying to solve that next problem, but actually to sit down and talk like, like collegial human beings about some stuff that you all have in common. It, it, it's actually a really great experience for most of our most for our team when we go out there. You know, I was in a session earlier about uh, the North Shore breach and, or not breach, I'm sorry, incident. Um, and, you know, somebody typed in the chat name, another uh, industry where you can call any of your competition at any time and everyone will be all hands on deck to help you. And it's just, it's a really cool right. community that way. And I'm sorry we can't be together in person, but next year in Jerusalem slash zigzag as they say, the end of Passover. All right, here we go, officially. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cybersecurity Framework for K-12, how we get the attention at all levels. My name is Kelly Williams-Brown. I'm actually the Communications Director for OETC, but that is way less interesting than the two other gentlemen on screen. Uh, essentially, we have all of the firepower behind Portland Public Schools right here today. We have CTO Don Wolf, and we have Deputy CTO Dr. Travis Pocky, uh, who I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with. So I'm going to hide myself and let these two get right to it. Gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to take just a second and pop up. We, we don't have an incredibly extensive uh, sharing, and this was still put together in, in mind of traditional ACPE, where you would actually have the hecklers in the back of the room that would call out. So please feel free to use... The, the text chats to to heckle as, as appropriate. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Don Wolf and I'm here with Dr. Travis Baki to talk about cyber safety. Now, after listening to Ralph yesterday, security um, and trying to figure out how we get attentions at, at all levels. I'm, I'm sure I'm the only person along with Travis that, that struggles with that. So I'm, I'm we more presented so that we could get and steal all of the information from from you all. So Along the way, we're going to be publishing some polls and doing um, some data collection that way, just as talking points. But please be liberal with within the chats. We're going to try and monitor that, and hopefully, would would prefer to have a two way dialogue rather than as much as we can here on AirMeet. So, Travis, do you want to get anything to kick off? We've really polished this presentation, so it's going to be really tight. <laughs> um, just kind of a. Um, one of the one of the things that we're really trying to focus on at PPS is trying to improve our posture. So, um, you know, we're we're not trying to, <clears throat> trying to say that we do these things and then we're secure. We're not trying to to compare our security to anybody else's. This is about trying to just be the best we can and looking to move that forward in any ways we can. Um, one of the things that was mentioned was, you know, this is an industry where you can call up anybody else that's in it and immediately get support or give that that information that you've discovered and developed. Um, how can we share more? What what can we do? What can we what can we offer you? What can you offer us? So with that, um, one of the things wanted to do two years ago was was the the brainchild for this particular um, title 
of this session, which was what I thought way back when was an idea of creating a dedicated uh, cybersecurity framework specifically for K-12. I felt like our needs were different enough that it wasn't as expansive enough. We could narrow the control set. So it wasn't quite so intimidating for so many folks that don't have a doc Dr. Pocky on staff or have the luxury of having an April Marduk or Stuart Long or any of anybody else who's gone through the CISO process and gained their, um, their certification. And more importantly, and I think this is the, the bigger driving force for that was to, to gain some mandates and some legislation and regulation around what happens in K-12 cybersecurity. Because right now it's a best effort and you really only pay attention to it once you've gotten bitten, unless you're smart. And it's really hard to get that upward and downward movement. So my thinking was if we had a dedicated framework, then we could get legislation that says, gosh, we're gonna mimic what we do in the financial sector and provide an audit on an annual basis or a biannual basis, because it takes a while to, to get a cybersecurity audit and then work through those, those high level remediation topics. So that's where this was born out from. I don't think we need another cybersecurity framework. I think NIST, the CFS is perfect for, for what we're doing. And as, as Dr. Paki had mentioned in a previous conversation, it's accessible not only to the people who are practitioners doing it in our school districts, but you can go out and you can throw a ball and probably hit three or four different people that that have some some background and can help you support that with that. So what we're really trying to do is build awareness and get some regulations and some real teeth into what we're doing. And, and that requires that attention at all levels from our levels, our, our peers, our superintendents, our boards, our legislators, and our people in our classrooms, our students, our teachers, and, and our aides. Travis, you were gonna. Um, yeah, just a, just a little bit there. You know, part of that is born out of the frustration of trying to improve security posture. You know, what is, what is your experience in doing that? Uh, if it's anything like ours, it is, um, it is met with a lot of opposition. There's usually never the the reaction of, oh, how great you're going to put in two-factor authentication or, you know, fantastic. I have been waiting for you to double the password link. But, you know, when what we're what we're looking for is look, we we are trying to do that. And often it's uphill. And sometimes it is in spite of the organization's best interest that, that we or the, the organization's will um, is operating against their own best interests. They, they want things for, to have ease of access, but that ease of access is actually making them a greater target. So trying to find a way that we can say, you know, what is, what is best practice? Um, how do we get people to stop saying to us, you know, this is not a bank and, and tr try and get a little bit more teeth in, look, we, we understand that in this industry where we have spent every penny we have and there's no pennies left, we, we can't, we're not asking for money left on the table. We're, we're as actually asking for enough money to do this well, which means it's probably got to come from somewhere else. How, how do we make that a, a value proposition that somebody's willing to entertain? And, and often you know, the, the easy answer for that is laws and regulations. That's one aspect of it. So that'll be a big focus here, at least part of our conversations. The other piece is, is how do you just start doing this? And, and how do you do this with the staff you have? Because um, even though we've got the will and, and a larger staff than most districts that, that, that are here, we still don't have enough people to do this well. And where can we start and, and how can we start doing that? Um, one of the great points I took away from, from yesterday's uh, conversation with, with the ethical hacker is it's, it's probably about third on our priority list. Security shouldn't be first. It, it, it should be the access to the tools and resources, the performance of those tools and resources, and then securing those two tools and resources and, and probably in that order, which is great. So how do we do that without shutting down what's happening in our classrooms? And this is one of my new favorite quotes. I'm stealing it from, from Doug Levin, um, who shared it, which was from Seneca the Younger way back when in early Roman times. And it's no wind blows in favor of a ship without direction. So if you're going to start jumping into and saying, I've got to secure my district and we've got to do things better, you better have a plan in place and you better know where you're going to start and what you want to accomplish. Otherwise, um, 
there is so much to do. You're, it's going to be like, forgive the analogy, a superintendent going to a, a sales conference and finding the, the, the display that has the, the brightest, blinkiest colors and coming back and saying, this is going to solve all our problems. You'll be jumping from one thing to the next thing, as opposed to following a direct dedicated path of, okay, we're going to make incremental improvements. We're going to grind on it day in, day out, and overall make the, the entire environment more secure because um, it's not going to happen all at once. And it's, it's, it's not something you do once and, and move on. It's something you do each and every day. And sometimes it's the same thing over and over again. And one, one real easy way to get that direction is to set up that roadmap. So, you know, one, one of the exercises we took on was take a look at a, a three to five year plan. You know, what it can be complete science fiction. You know, for me, that, that science fiction is I'm going to pry back admin rights. Um, shouldn't be science fiction, but that's something that I'm going to work really hard to get. And that's, a, that's at about month 18 of my three year plan. Uh, that's that's one of the things that I set out to do was try and map out what I need to do over the course of that period of time. And then I can start mapping controls into accomplishing those goals. Which oddly you should mention that I just published a poll asking that very same question. Do, does your district, have you guys created? So we're curious to see where folks are at with that. One of the easiest ways and I'm going to um, steal again from Doug Levin and show this next thing. It's I call it the Levin risk continuum. I believe he stole it from somebody in Australia at a conference he saw, um, was kind of plotting, if, if you haven't developed a roadmap, here's, here's one quick and easy way to kind of help frame that conversation for you. So if you look at this, down at the bottom, you've got your mission and function criticality is what, what is the piece, where does it fit in to our mission and how critical is, is the function from, from low to high? And then over on the left-hand side, you'll look at, you've got threats, the different types of threats that come in, whether it's a student inside the classroom that's buying DDoS attacks on the dark web to run from their phone, or whether it's a ransomware attack or whatnot, you've got unsophisticated to sophisticated there. And at the center, at the green, is your, your comprehensive baselines, just your basic security controls. Do we have type passwords? Are we looking at some of the simple stuff like MFA? Are we looking at some of the simple stuff like removing admin rights? All of those types of things. And that should take care of a, a lot of the bulk. And then you've got to make decisions about where you're going to spend your time and effort, which is looking at the sophisticated attacks and where they sit in the spectrum of mission criticality. Are they low? Then we're probably not going to focus on them. If they're high, that's going to be, you know, it's kind of the opposite of the Gartner's quadrant. It's in that same element. But that's where we're going to spend our, our time and our resources on looking at that. So it's helped me kind of frame how I, what keeps me up at night because something's going to keep me up at night. I know that's going to, that's not going to change. Um, but it, it, maybe I can narrow the focus instead of it being a thousand things. Some other quick hits and we've picked these up along the way. Um, some of them are very tactical. Some of the ways just to, to get to that green baseline. Um, looking at the top left there is, it's not, don't outlaw Excel. I'm not saying let's kill Microsoft products. We can have a whole other discussion around that. I'm, I'm Google first all the way, whatever. It's, it's the macros. And so it could include Word and other things there, but it's, it's that disabling the downloading and usage of macros from the internet. Just, just stop it already. If, if, if they're macros you need, they should be published properly and they shouldn't just be in game, being grabbed from the internet. So do that. Um, another quick hit, how many, and I'm wondering, I'm going to pull an, another poll here. It looks like the majority of folks here do not have a cybersecurity roadmap on their way. So right after this, you've got some work to do. That's great. I'm going to close that poll. I'm going to step up this next one because we just recently did this and we'll talk about um, where we're at, but is creating passwords that are not easily guessable. We have spent a lot of time, and if you're not familiar with the uh, correct horse staple or battery staple XKCD, it's worth going to doing a Google. I don't think you can pick it all up here, but we've spent a lot of time saying we've got to have really complex passwords with a special character and a number and a capital and all of that. 
And those are actually really easy for computers to decipher and to crack. You know, on average, that 8 to 10, 12 character password takes about three days for a computer to get. But if you just expand it out into something that is easier to remember and longer characters, then you've, you've just created a much harder password to crack. Now, if you've been to any Rachel's sessions this week, she will talk about as soon as we implemented this about a year ago, where right now in Portland Public Schools, your uh, kindergarten to fifth grade students have a mini minimum character length of a 12 character password, no specials, you can use spaces, so you can use a book quote, a song lyrics, whatever, or, or you know, uh, correct horse battery staple, if you want. We've actually blocked that password from being used because we use this cartoon um, to to propagate this. And our in our grade six through all of our staff, it's a um, I want a sixteen character or longer password that is in place. The one limitation is that we have a system that won't accept anything beyond a 32 character password. So it's between 16 and 32 characters. So, and it looks like the majority of you are out there with, with much longer passwords. That's great. Um, what, will, what will shoot this down is the advent of quantum computing is soon gonna be available on your desktop and it won't take very long to, to crack those with a quantum computer. So, but, Neither will all, all, all of our most, most of our encryption will also be out the door too. So we'll have a whole different battle to fight. You know, one thing about that, that's um, we, we ran an unintentional and fascinating experiment. So um, we were, we unveiled this plan to, to go to our administrators uh, on the 16 character password for staff. And um, we, we broke the administrators into three groups. And in the first group, um, we get up and we, you know, we're going through the, the security stuff and then we get to the, oh, and by the way, we're going to change your password to 16 characters. And this cry erupts from the back of the room and then the whole room erupts into protest. Like it, it was, it was amazing. It was just that, that one voice and this reflection of how big of a, how big culture plays in whether or not security is, is well received. We did it again with the second group and nobody said a thing like it just not a peep. And like, All right. Well, uh, that sucks, but wh whatever. And then the third, we actually had uh, somebody applaud in the back of the room. So, you know, it, it's it seems like there's a lot of the the loudest voice syndrome that com comes with some of these changes and putting people in into a place where they can see the context of it. Like maybe maybe that was our part. Part of this that we missed was maybe explaining the context and the value and how little it's going to actually impact you once it's implemented. Um, but the other two groups had nothing to say about it, even though it was the exact same people or the, the exact same role throughout the organization. So um, un, unintentional and very unscientific experiment, but just fascinating results. And to live that out since that change, there hasn't, I, we haven't gotten kicked in the shins once for, for making the change. Um, so um, somebody had asked in the chat if we can make those available. If somebody knows how, please chat me how. I, I just know that they show up and I, I don't see, there's not like over on the create a poll section how, how you can make it available other than it's sitting there. So I apologize for that. Right now, looking at this poll, districts that require 10 characters or more, 62% of you, 36% of you don't. And there's about 2% that aren't sure, which is, Totally valid. So going back to what else is here on the slide. So no macros, macros bad, don't allow them downloaded. Expand your passwords, make them easier to read because what we've also found or anecdotal, this is not a scientific research, is finding fewer sticky notes underneath teachers' keyboards where they've written their password down because they can't remember all of the special characters. Now they're using things like a favorite quote or whatnot. It's easier to remember, it makes you better. I would also throw out there, I'm pushing the idea of using a secure password locker. Uh, my favorite is 1Password um, because they don't store anything on their site. So even if they do get compromised, the data doesn't live with them. It's still on my devices they don't have. Um, it, it pushes it back and forth. They don't have any of the key and secret um, implementations to actually make mine usable. So that's that's a big one for me. And I spent some time making sure that all of my passwords are random and really long and awful, and I don't have to remember them. Um, 
2FA, that's an easy one. That's a no-brainer. I'm going to close this poll and ask this one out there as well on 2FA. Go ahead, Travis. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, April had a question in chat. Do we require all complexity for staff passwords? Yes, uh, although it's minimal. So um, one of the things that we were trying to avoid was repeats. Um, my very unfortunate last name is actually illegal in most Microsoft um, online services. So um, <clears throat> I've had to come up with different ways of, of getting to that. But um, making sure that we don't have large sequences of repeating characters, making sure that we don't have um, common dictionary words and uh, we we do allow spaces and um, we don't force uh, the use of symbols. And the last thing out of a quick kit that I was going to hit here. So the, the last poll, excuse me, let me jump back to the poll here. 23, 23 out of the 94 of you have responded to that. And it's about 50, 50 on 2FA on any, any or all of their systems. Um, I will tell you right now, Portland public schools has, 2FA on very limited systems. We've made it available for our entire Google domain. It's not required. So um, if you want to sign up, you can. That's changing. If anybody here from Portland Public Schools happens to see this, um, that's summer work that's that's happening over there. And we're actually, as part of our security profile, standing up an SSO portal. We're 2FA into that should open it up and make things easier across the board. But part of that will be a, a full on 2FA for all of our staff into, into our critical systems. That would include Google, that would, which is our email. Financial system is, is where we have 2FA currently enabled and work from there. So the, the fourth bit down there would be adopt a framework and start getting, getting, getting familiar with it. If you haven't picked, if you haven't landed on it, if you're still not sure if you wanna do CIS or if you wanna do NIST, pick one and, and start reading and becoming familiar and start thinking of those things that fit in, in the Levin uh, risk continuum and, and where they fit appropriately, and then start building your roadmap if you don't have it already. If you already have it already, start making making notations of, of where you're at and how you're gonna address it over the, over the next few years. Um, the other piece, I don't, I don't have a particular talking point on this is, um, or at least a graphic for it, excuse me, I highly suggest, and this is easy, it just costs money, is to get an outside vendor. There's great resources. I watched April's um, April Murdoch from um, Seattle this morning talk about the self-assessment. That's a great place to start. I know for me, self-assessments are the, the, the least useful tool because my subconscious makes wants to make me look really good and feel really good about myself. And so I know whatever self-assessment I complete, whether it's security, whether it's interoperability, whether it's personality traits, I cheat and I fudge my answers. Um, and that's just me. So don't don't assume that I, I am saying all self-assessments are bad. I'm just saying how I respond to them. I would engage with a third party vendor that's got a track record to, to provide an audit for your environment. Um, I've done that before at a previous district, came out with a beautiful assessment, high risk, low to medium risk, and, and really low risk. And that high risk stuff provided a 12 month, excuse me, a 18 to 24 month roadmap of what we needed to address with that fit perfectly into the continuum of risk. Um, so find the money to make that happen if, if you can, because there's, there's nothing also that speaks louder to a board or to a superintendent or to a supervisor than, than the profit from afar. Um, they, they often tune us out. I, I know I can say the same thing over and over again. And when somebody else says it, it's from the Council of Great City Schools or from COSAN, or if it just happens to be Steve Lankford from Beaverton, then it must be true. And even though it's the exact same thing I've said, now we can we can move that forward. I'm missing, am I missing anything in the chats there? 50 minutes. 20, 50 questions, 20 minutes. Love that. And I will take that, April, just so you know, just because we would have, I'm, I'm actually going to go back through and, and take that just to see. I, I want to have that bit of anecdotal information. We are going to bring somebody in to do an assessment for, for Portland Public Schools, um, hopefully here sooner rather than later. But Travis, I think this is your side because you love a good crisis. 
Yeah. Um, you know, the, there was a time where the, the attitude at PPS was, you know, we want to keep things hush hush. You know, we spend enough time in the paper as it is. Whatever we do, let's make sure anything we find um, is kept quiet. Um, and, and, you know, with with leadership changes and um, and just being more aware of, of our ecosystem, that's changed now. So, um, you know, the, the first one I'll talk about is, um, you know, how to send $2.9 $2 million on a European vacation. Um, and, and it was it was a fascinating event. If anybody can tell me how, how they think this happened, I'm all ears because our, our people never got to the bottom of it. But um, we had somebody call up and, you know, the, the thing about public sectors, our contracts are public, and we had a large construction project that was going through, and um, the the usual um, compromise comes up. Hey, I've got a. You're about to send me a transfer. We've changed banks. We need you to. We need you to update our banking information. Okay. Well, I need you to fill out this form. So fills out the form. All right. Well, we need a picture of the canceled, or we need a picture of a check. So look at the picture of the check that was sent back. It was clearly a, a check on a counter um, that had been photoshopped to actually show the business name. But these exchanges are happening via email. And it was, uh, instead of being it being constructioncompany.net, it was construction-company.net. Um, so we'll, that'll be important. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, we, we looked at that and um, went through where they, they verified that everything met standard and they approved the change. The change was met, the money was sent, and all of a sudden our highest up in our financial department gets a call from a vice president at Wells Fargo saying, you know, I really wasn't too familiar with PPS's business operations, but I'm almost positive that you don't send million dollar transfers to Europe. Oh no. Um, so so we, we go through all of this and, and what we find was um, the domain they were sending the email, construction-company.net, wasn't registered. How, how did the email get in and out of the system? The, the only thing we can think of is that the actual individual's account, email account got compromised and they were catching the bounces, maybe. Um, our our cyber, insur cyber insur insurance people could not get to the bottom of it. They asked for log after log. We looked at the machine itself that this happened on lots of interesting problems. But you know, this incident came shortly after another incident where, um, and I may have mentioned this in another talk, sorry if this is repetitive for people, but we had um, a machine come up and start encrypting everything that was connected to its shared drive. And that, you know, it happens. Um, but what was really interesting was we go to pull the machine apart and um, and we find where it had encrypted a bunch of files about 13 months ago and stopped. And then it encrypted a bunch more uh, over the course of that 13 months leading up to that final incident. The thing had been on that machine just waiting for triggers forever. And then when we pulled it off the network and brought it down for, for, for analysis, it self-destructed. Like the, the code was just gone. So a couple of really puzzling incidents that were kind of head scratchers. Like how do we, how can we say this won't happen again? So you've that, that never let a crisis go to waste to say, look, we need to take immediate action on some of these. We need to do immediate end user security training. We need to do immediate endpoint detection and response. We need to get this out there. And this is that crisis that, that we're going to use to elevate the visibility of this thing and make sure that we get it spent and we get it prioritized and we do it immediately. And, and I highly recommend that. If you've got, a, got an opportunity to publicize one of these, make sure that it doesn't go to waste. Yes. Always, always make use of the, the opportunities you've got to talk about it, which leads me to my next poll that I'm going to make live here. Um, how often, because before we before we jump into this and, and talk about some of our end user stuff is part of this is how do we get awareness at all levels? Um, and the one that seems to be a, a big struggle is the superintendent and cabinet senior leadership in a district. And, and how do you get them on board with cybersecurity, cyber safety conversations and knowing that it's a resource that needs to be funded. Um, and, and what does that look like? Uh, very curious about that. Some people have had better luck. I, I know 
um, from experience or from anecdotally, the, the leaders in IT that have been there for, for the longest amount of time, the Rachel Linty Cheney's, the Steve Langford's that have been double digits at, at their particular shop have had better luck at having those frequent conversations and getting that buy-in. Um, and being relatively new to Portland, I'm looking for to steal, like I said at the beginning, we, normally if this would have been more interactive, it's like, what are the, what are the tactics? What are, what are the things that work well for you um, to get those conversations, to get them regularly happening? Um, this next slide is, you know, communicate and train, and it goes al along with that. You've got to communicate and train with both senior leadership, the board, that that segment of your of your district, but also down with the the regular working folks in other departments and at the buildings, the front office secretary, the principal secretary, the classroom teacher, the instructional assistant. All of those are just as critical because they're being fished all of the time, right? So. One of these things, this, I, I, I have, I don't know what that particular disease is called, but when you see that, those feet dangling over that, that precipice, that always gives me a little bit of vertigo and makes me want to vomit. Um, and that's my reminder is fear tactics with our folks don't work. We want them to be aware of the risk and what's real and what um, are the consequences of this, but always crying wolf and always saying there's a fire in the crowded theater isn't ultimately going to get you the long-term buy-in and support for a cybersecurity program that you want. So trying to stay away from those scare tactics. I, I, I know that has been critical in previous places and getting other conversations that are happening in our district moving forward. Jump in anytime you want, Travis. Well, you know, the, the one thing I would say here also is that we're, we're really focused on how do we how do we try and make a, a communication that doesn't get easily discounted, right? The, you know, the, the, this is not a bank is, is kind of a, it, you know, thank you, Captain Obvious. It's not a bank. You're, you're absolutely right. But um, we also need to make sure that we don't wind up in this vicious cycle, right? We haven't done anything about cybersecurity. So nothing has happened uh, or nothing has happened. And because nothing has happened, maybe it's not that important. So we're going to continue to do nothing about cybersecurity. How do we, how do we, prevent that because yeah the the motive there is then well nothing nothing's gone wrong why should i make it important now how are you going to how are you going to say all right we need to take money from somewhere else and put it in this thing because nothing bad has happened yet so the the obvious answer is well you you go and look at the at the news reports and you look at all the bad things that happened to all these people um it's it's a careful art, and uh, I would say that you know I'm I'm no better at it than anybody else. Uh, it, it is it is very easy to fall back to that. But wait, look at Baltimore, or you know look at look at something that happened to somebody, and that could happen to us, and that immediately gets discounted. How how do we make sure that that voice gets heard, and, and the evidence is clearly there, but you don't want to lead with that. Here here is the risk that we we are exposed to, here's some evidence that it's happened to others. Now, how do we approach this topic? So one of the, one of the things that we're doing, um, we've got an example of efficient that we, we try and communicate. We haven't done it. I will, I will be really honest. I haven't pushed as hard, particularly in this last year where everybody is doing 43 more things than they ever thought they were going to be doing in their current job just to keep schools open. Um, but we've worked really hard. We, we subscribe to know before. Um, we've run a number of phishing campaigns. We, we set our baseline not too long ago. Um, fun fact, right? We had been working for about six months to convert from O365 as our mail platform to Google full time. We'd done all the run up. We were getting ready to start three months before we go. We said, okay, here's our date. Our date for cutover is gonna be March 20th, 2020. And <laughs> yes, that's kind of what we were doing. I think it was more crying than laugh crying. But um, by that time, it was too late. Enough of the train had left the station that there was no way to pull back and say, we're not going to convert. So that, that entire spring break, when everybody's rushing to go out for, for quarantine, at that time, we, were think we all thought, right, two, three weeks, maybe a month, and then we'll be back to school. 
Um, we said there's no way we can pull back. We're actually going to do more damage than good if we pull back. So we just moved forward. And lo and behold, there wasn't there wasn't a hiccup. We had, you know, there was a handful of folks in a district of 8,000 employees um, and 10,000 mailboxes that, you know, some of the rules didn't populate properly or some of their folders didn't convert to labels properly. It was not a big deal. Not long after that, we ran a, a baseline phishing exam. Um, Am, am I am I getting my dates correct, Travis? It wasn't it wasn't too right. long after that that we said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna push out, um, it, just to get a baseline to all of our staff to to figure out where we're at, and we did okay. But what I like about Know Before is you can push this out, get all the responses, and then you can, based on the type of phishing you get, you can push training directly to the users that failed, and whether it was a one level fail that they clicked the link or a two level fail, they click the link and they provided their username and password, you can give them you know, targeted instructions to that. So that's that's been a great resource and we need to use that more and, and target that more. And also just having regular communications on why we're doing what we're doing, using some of the MS, MS ISAC information that we're getting, not that we wanna give them the technical, but putting it in a language that they understand what the risk is and, and why it's real and, and why you should care about it because because we're not a bank is the biggest reason we should care about it. Our, our job is to protect students and their privacy and their data and our staff and their privacy and their financial well-being. The biggest thing, and some of you have heard this more often than just this time for me, is the thing that that's terrifies me most that drives me around security is so many of our kids can get compromised now. A, a bad actor can start building a credit profile based on that student's information that now they, more recently, they can check, they can look at it before they turned 18. It used to be they couldn't even look at their credit history until they turned 18. That's changed, those laws have changed. But unless you're actually doing that, unless you have a family that's proactively doing that, you can run 10, 12 years of bad credit to a student. So when they walk out, they've got no recourse. They can't fix that kind of damage on, on their information. They can't, there's no way to rehabilitate it. For me, or for many of you, not many of you as, are as old as I am, because I'm as older than dirt at this point, is if, if, if I were to be com compromised and my credit were taken over, I have 20, 30 years of credit history that can go back to prove and verify who I am to, to give me a reasonable hope of reclaiming my, my good credit and my financial backing. Students, that wouldn't happen. They would, they would, they would be done. And, and that's the thing that terrifies me the most. And that's why, yes, we're not banks, which is why we have all the more reason to, to, a bit, to do a better job than banks do. Well, and if you also look at the, the long game for stealing school data, you, you've got a lot of really interesting data in there. If, if you've ever gone and looked up your own credit history, they ask you some questions to remotely validate that you are who you say you are. You know, and one of, the, one of the things is looking at your old addresses, right? So you might have old addresses, mother's maiden names, I think weird things that you know, supposedly only you would know. But think about all that you're giving that criminal by giving them that history. You may be giving them histories of addresses. You may be giving them old names. You may be giving them schools attended. It's it's not just the the immediate compromise. We we keep thinking, or we have this tendency to think of what is the immediate effect of what we do, or or what we have had done. Um, think about what this looks like in ten years, or you know what what is that that data has value because it can be stored forever. What if somebody just needs to know, hey, did Bob Smith ever live at you know five 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 Main Street? We could have that. And April brings up a great point: is is purge what you don't what what you're not required to keep, purge it, get rid of it, so it's not there. Um, right. That's a huge one. Um, I threw up, you know, this internet center for internet security. Um, that's that's where you're going to find NIST and all of that. But they have a ton of great resources to slowly let you wade into the realm of cybersecurity and how you can make a difference as a professional and and resources that you can provide to your staff that don't really even understand it or necessarily have an inkling for this. But or or you can, you know, be pushed into the deep end and, you know, start learning by drowning a little bit. Um, it's as deep and as wide as you want it to be. Um, couple more here. 
The other thing that I w really want to harp on, though, and, and this is a big one, is figuring out how you're going to build those allies and, and how you're going to have those conversations um, with, with the other departments. It's not an IT thing. Cybersecurity, cyber safety is, is, should not just be viewed as an IT thing. We're pushing it. We're leading the conversation because everybody, well, it's got, a, it's, it's got a plug and there's some lights that blink. It must be yours. And it, it can't be just ours. How, the HR data and how they are processing and handling and managing their data and what they're, what they're sharing and how they're sharing it, our financial data, our financial processes, our SPED records, our SPED processes, all of that stuff, it, it can't just be us. And the only way we're going to get ahead of it as a district and as a community is if we're bringing everybody into it to be diligent and mindful and practicing good cyber safety all the time as much as they possibly can. And some of the stuff that I've seen in, in industry, so I, I meet with um, other CISOs or, or people in that CISO role in, in the Portland community, and um, this becomes as much of a, a PR um, gig as it does an actual technical one. How do you get out to all the, all the user community, things that they want to know about cybersecurity, and then have them apply that practice at work? Um, and, and you know thing, things up to and including um, you know challenges of the month that go out in a monthly newsletter. How do you get how do you get approval to even send that newsletter to all of your staff? Just different types of engagement to make sure that 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 is publicized and it is front of mind for people, so that they they recognize you know look this is not a one time training that we're going to be forced through or you know we have to watch it as a part of the annual training and and we just kind of turn down the volume and let it play for for ten minutes while we while we do other things, making sure that it's something that they're actually engaged in. You know, how do you protect your bank account? How do you how do you make sure that your home email doesn't get compromised? Things along those lines where I've heard other leaders are trying to trying to make this immediate and personal for the end user so that it doesn't get lost. Uh, going back to, um, oh, we actually have a Q&A. So, uh, Francisco, so how, question is, so how is PPS going to create a program that is sustainable with trained staff? I see no, so many districts in ESD hire staff only to see them leave within a year. Well, th that's, that's a great question, Francisco. Um, I'm fortunate I'm sitting here, you know, with, with Dr. Travis Pocky. He is the only doctor of cybersecurity in the K, focused on K-12 that, that I'm aware of. And I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna hold him forever and keep him close because he's incredibly valuable and he's incredibly valuable to lots of other places. We just saw, you know, many people saw the swan song or the farewell of Nathan McNulty out of BSD earlier this, this week. Um, he's, he's an incredible resource and it's really hard to keep, keep folks here. So you have to develop the culture you have to develop and find folks that believe in the mission. Travis is still here and he's been at PPS for a long time because he believes in the mission, because he believes in what we're trying to do and make it a, you know, K-12 public education is, is a core value of his. Those people are hard to find, granted. So how, how are we leveraging? We're, we're trying to build an internship program in a broader generalities around IT for Portland Public Schools, but our students are brilliant. Um, that's one of the ones we're trying to make a reality. How do we create that pipeline from student all the way through help desk te technician into the next CTO? We've got a good candidate in our staff right now um, for someday, um, but how do we get more of those and how do we formalize a process like that is one of those things we're, we're trying to see. But the reality is we all need to be prepared to be in that continual training process. Find that next person. We have a security analyst that, um, you know, they the the last people that have been there have come in, got the role, they've got the, some training, they've got some experience. They say, I've worked at PP, Portland Public Schools. It's a really large enterprise that looks really good on a resume and gotten snarfled up by other people around the country. Um, just know that's going to have to be part of of the muscle that you can flex. Well, and and I think the other piece is is that we we sometimes don't look at um, our value proposition well enough. So. 
if you can hire a recent college grad and and it's a great recent college grad, you can take that RCG and you can say, look, I've got public student loan forgiveness and you've got $90,000 worth of college loans. Like we're talking about a, a $30,000, $40,000 forgiveness towards the end of this. That's a heck of a bonus. Like yeah. if, if we figure out ways to couch this right and ways that we can, we can really work this for people, um, yeah, there, there's a, the other things that we try to do. I, I look at sponsoring H-1B visas, which does cost money, um, but it, it also gets you access to people that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have access to. These are these are fantastic tools that are available. And that is a that is a, a thirty thousand um, dollar event over that course of time. But think about what you might be getting on top of that keeping that institutional knowledge plus um, somebody with a, with a master's degree in computer science and a long-term exposure to the field. Like this could, this could get you a long way. Um, Ty, you mentioned invest in your staff. Yeah, absolutely. I, I make sure that my people get access to all of the online training they need and some of the in-person, so long as we're not in COVID or locked down. I try to make sure that the, the tools that are available to them are the best tools that they can have or the tools that they're most familiar with and that they get access to the training that they ask for. And usually um, my, my staff are, are really great about, I, I, I don't need the most expensive thing. You know, I don't want you to send me to a SANS course in Honolulu, but they, they do ask for, for training and it, it's generally very reasonable. So go back over to the poll results. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to that for just a second here. Um, the first question I asked was how often do you cabinet and, and or superintendent and majority is rarely um, sometimes or, or when asked, there's not a lot of frequently. And same thing with the board. And as a matter of fact, I, there was a cheeky answer, board, what's, what is board involvement? Um, I am hopeful that when, when we complete, I mean, I'm going to be pushing for, we're doing an outside assessment to settle this. I actually have a question from our board around budget and what our bond efforts are doing to help with our security profile. So I'm gonna use that as kind of a um, carrot to, to, to seed you know, the conversation like, look, we're gonna be doing an assessment and really wanna share those results with them. It's kind of a tricky, sticky wicket. It was mentioned in, in the session yesterday that you can't enter executive session to share those types of conversations, but you can talk about it in a general enough way to give them an idea um, and you can give them the executive summary ahead of time. It doesn't have to be part of the public record so they can know exactly what we're facing um, as, as part of our launch point. One of, the, one of the large things we'll have at the end of, the, end of our, all of our bond, we've got a good chunk of our bond money to focus on cybersecurity is you know, kind of that dashboard that will give us those quick hits and that will give us that quarterly, monthly, however we wanna do it, reporting metrics to the board so that we can identify those pieces that should be relevant for them to know so that we can provide that to them in somewhat of an automated fashion that um, is a little bit shadowed from what a public records request could, could potentially ask for. All right, the, the, the last big slide here is, uh, A, one of my favorite shots of the St. John's Bridge and um, just other questions, insights, thoughts that you all have. How can you help us move PPS forward in, in, our, in, our, in our push to, to create a more well-rounded, robust uh, cybersecurity, cyber safety program? That's a tough one, Josh. Uh, although that, that is something to consider. Like, you can you can go to a, a large security conference like Black Hat or or um, or DefCon and not really talk to anybody. Like ACPE is a very collegial, um, tight knit group. And if you if you walk away from ACPE not having gained something new, like you tried, or you were extremely hungover and you couldn't retain anything. Like there <laughs> there is a there is an extreme value to this community itself. And, and and to how we share information. Yeah, we're we're unique. Um, I'm uh, part of a, a different organization, the Council of Great City Schools, by being lucky enough to have been hired at Portland Public Schools. And the CIOs there meet 
and there's there's conversations and there's there's some bleed over there, but it's nothing like what we have here. Um, and I feel uniquely blessed to get to be a part of this community on a regular basis because there's some really big brains out there. Um, and I try to tap into those as much as possible because those who have been around me enough know that I need you. So take advantage of this community. So Jeff Gibbs, uh, uh, district's doing peer reviews on disaster recovery plans or risk assessments. Um, that's not a bad idea at all. Hey, did you think about your buses or, you know, how are you going to get food out? Or the, we had started a business continuity plan planning exercise and uh, ironically we canceled it because of COVID. So uh, hoping to get back to that. But um, one, one of the things that we, we would really like to do is, is maybe present that like this, this is, it's, it's not top secret. Exactly. I was just typing, I'll just say it here for Brent's benefit. If, if only HR would turn those policies over to IT and we could formulate all those policies, then we'd have no other issues. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued. April, I'm, I'm intrigued. What if we created an ACPE? What, what do you mean by that? Like, like a security focused, that's all it does all the time organization? Oh, and then you respond oh. already. Yeah. I, I, I love that idea. So a peer review of a policies of uh, you know, disaster recovery and business continuity plans. Um, you know, one, one of the things that's really um, disappointing about private sector is, you know, you, you don't have to be, it's kind of like being chased by a bear, right? You don't have to be the fastest. You just have to be faster than the slowest. The bear will catch the slowest and, and you keep on going. So you really don't help out your competition by sharing your hard fought password plan or password policy or your, your hard, hard fought uh, business continuity plan. Um, we don't have that. Uh, a, a library of, of completed documents would be fantastic, especially since they're already in the public domain anyway, right? I mean, we maybe not, public domain is not the right word, but they are uh, susceptible to public records requests. So there's probably no secrets there. I, I, would, I would love to share what we'd have. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how, how you do it, Jamie. Um, I know the average size of ADM of, of schools in Oregon or the median size of schools in Oregon is 600 students. Um, and, you know, Travis uses adeptly when, when, when HIPAA rules went in, into place, they didn't care what size you were. There's teeth for, for the small mom and pop just all the way up to, you know, the, the large OHSUs and those, you know, Blue Shield, Blue Cross, same rules apply. I, I don't know how folks like you all do that, Josh, out there in in enterprise. It's it's tiny areas. That's that's a lot to do. So how can we lean in together? Um, what does a statewide virtual SOC look like? What does you know a region wide or a West Coast or however you want to um, apply that? And keep in mind when things like the privacy rule went in, you know, it wasn't with the idea that the the three person medical practice hires a cybersecurity professional. The the idea was that industry would swoop in and fill the gap. We're going to offer you this service, or you're going to keep your medical records on this thing, and that's now that addresses your compliance needs. Like what what we would hope is that we do have the ability to to kind of get in there and start finding solutions for for the small districts that, you know, it, it's unreasonable to expect you to be able to do this on your own. It, we do need other solutions that can address that. Yeah. Can't be done. And just saying everything's in the cloud is, <laughs> that, that's not a security program, folks. I just, just in case that needed to be said out loud. Right. And, and it's not a it's not a business continuity plan either. Um, if if Stuart were here or Makoa or I'm not sure if Rachel were here, um, along that vein of you know business continuity in case you're hacked, what do you do when your AD goes down? 
what do you do when your, your single authentication source goes down and all your cloud resources are based on that? Um, Travis, no, you don't get to resign. That's, that's not a clause that's in your contract or in our working agreement. Um, and will never happen. That's, that's a good rock, Jake. Um, but, you know, and what solutions are out there? I would love this group to sit at a table and kind of figure out. I know Stuart and, and that group of, you know, Okta is one of them. Complete Pure Azure AD is, is another potential solution. But, you know, how do we get to that, that place? And it's going to be in our lifetime. We'll, we'll, we'll see that distributed. But, but also, how do you unwind all of your on-prem services and things that require those AD attributes? and how you're populating user accounts and what groups they belong to and what membership rights they have. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really big knot to unwind. Um, so that, that may, may, maybe that, maybe that's the kickoff for the next, the next conference is, is, is that business continuity, where does the cloud fit in and how do we keep this all secure? We could have fun. Maybe we could all be in person at that point. See, when, when I saw the time slot, I was still in the old ACPE. Well, oh, the 12 o'clock time slot on the last day, nobody's going to be here because everybody's driving home because they're still really hung over from the Cisco Margarita Club. And here's still 113 people. Now, I don't know how many people are asleep or not, but there's some that are active here. <laughs> Huge. <you, laughs> just lock them in. Ah. Uh, and and we went further. I, I didn't believe we'd get this far with with this much to say. So keep it rolling if there's other questions or if anybody wants to come on stage. Um, I'm just going to put in a shameless plug real quick. I, I know many of you have seen things about K-12-6. I, I would highly recommend you start leveraging them as a resource if you haven't already. Um, we, we also do have access to MS Isaac um, in, in our industry. Um, there is there is a little bit of overlap now, but there there is a lot of things that we can leverage those Isaacs and those sharing communities for. Free. Uh, the cost is free for the first year and looking at creative solutions for the next. I was just going to leave them hanging at the, at the free, <laughs> that, that's the future state. It's like, it's like how we adopt most of our stuff is with grants, right? Yep. Happy to hang out folks, but. You've got to believe you're, you're tired of hearing some of this. Thank you all for coming. I hope it's been a great success. success. Um, I, I, I hope um, you all thank the folks, the ACPE board, the folks from OETC that are volunteering to help with manage and be curators for, for this and all of our vendors that have put on an incredibly challenging and um, rewarding conference in, in this time. We all missed it desperately last year. We really needed this. Um, and they've done a great job of doing this virtually. And um, if you get a chance, tell them thank you. I really, I, I hate to agree with Steve Langford on something like this, but I love these emojis. The, the self-portrait behind me is not a self-portrait of me. That is something my wife has painted long before she ever met me. I live with that artist, and it, I, that's the re reason I get return engagements on Zoom meetings is most people just want to look at that. But, but thanks, Summer. <laughs> Kelly Williams Brown, were you coming in to say something awesome and to close us out? She's hiding, hiding in the background. <laughs> I think that's a ruse and you're gonna blame it on uh, Joe Marlock again.
Thank you all. <laughs> well, of course, Luke, that's, I mean, that's why you're going to be out there forever. It's always Morlock's fault. I'm just glad that Jamie got the cover that he got when Morlock got hired out there. 